pre-video disclaimer. I'm holding in my hand an Addis Dive 36mm wristwatch. It is an unashamed copy of a vintage uh, 50s, 60s Rolex Explorer. 36mm um, case size and case shape and everything else. It is an unashamed copy of that. I know some people won't like that. Uh, to those people, I say, eh, pff, you know. I mean, it's it's what it is. And frankly, I bought this watch. I have no affiliation with Addis Dive. Uh, this is not an advert. I bought this watch because I like the vintage 36mm Explorer, but I simply do not have vintage 36mm Explorer money. It's as simple as that. And liking the look and knowing it's going to be of reasonable quality for the price that I've paid, which is about 145 pounds, great British pounds, then there you go. What more can you say? Uh, without further ado, let's get into the unboxing and review portion. Hi guys, and welcome to this unboxing overview and review of the Addis Dive 2023. Um, I believe the model is called. It's essentially a copy of the 36mm Rolex Explorer, the original Rolex Explorer from the late 50s, 60s. So we've got the Addis Dive branded box. We'll get rid of that. Um, nice minimal packaging. This is direct from the Addis Dive store, incidentally. Uh, in this Pelly type case, as they tend to come, um, and having just clipped my nails, I've just discovered that uh, these are very hard to open, but nice and secure. And inside we've got the watch. We've got the uh, little warranty card for what that's worth, uh, having never had to use one. I've got a little pin tool for the bracelet because they are push pin links rather than screw links. And we've got a little user manual. We'll take a look at those in a moment because the thing we're interested in here is, of course, the watch itself. So let's pop that aside and down here wrapped in its glorious plastic we've got the Rolex Explorer alike Addis Dive as we can see. Obviously uh, it's a little different to the original Explorer. We've got sapphire crystal whereas the original would have had plexiglass. I'm going to go ahead and remove the packaging And then we will take a good look at the watch and give it a wind and see how it performs with a first wind on the time grapher, if I can find the end of the wrapping back in a moment. So here we are unwrapped, um, very securely wrapped all over the, uh, the entire thing, clasp the, uh, there's a sticker on the case back, which is very nicely etched, which we'll have a close up look shortly at all of that. And the quality, just from an initial appearance, is really, really nice. It has the PT5000 movement, which is a clone of the ETA 28242, and uh, beats at 28,800 VPH, and is a well-tried and tested movement, as everybody knows. Obviously, it's a clone of the ETA. It's not an ETA movement itself. Very nice milled clasp with engraving and the polishing and finishing and edges look really good and nice and sharp. I'm, I'm impressed so far. This particular one is, is essentially a copy of the original James Bond watch as he would have worn in the novels. And I'm gonna do a separate video on that because that's an interesting little bit of history because everybody just naturally assumes James Bond uh, Rolex Submariner. And that's not the case, not the case at all. If you're a Bond fan, you will know this. And there we've got, in addition to all the wrapping, we've got the lovely genuine Addis Dive hang tag. Rare, keep hold of that, you know. So first thing I'm going to do is we'll unscrew the crown and I'm gonna give that a wind. That's actually really nice. I'm gonna see if I can, I don't know if you'll actually be able to hear this, but it's actually really nice and smooth. Hopefully, hopefully that comes across as suspected. It has got the two position crown with 
what's technically a ghost position, I suppose you would say. Uh, it does hack, which is nice. I'm not hearing a calendar wheel clicking over there, so I'm assuming, although it has the position for a calendar wheel, I'm assuming that it's probably uh, just been removed rather than left in place, as I have seen happen on some of the homage watches. So the bracelet is brushed stainless um, on the underside and the top and it uses push pins. It's polished on the side, quite highly polished as you can see there. Polished sides to the case, nice smooth and Rolex styled, oyster styled case. Brushing to the top, nice sharp edges. The dial finish, this is all from um, an, a sort of normal viewpoint, just looking at it, the dial finish looks very nice. Nice crisp lettering, numerals and uh, good quality hands and loom and such. Screw down crown with the Steel Dive logo. We'll look at this all close up shortly. And then the clasp, which as I say, is a stainless steel milled clasp. No micro adjustment on it other than the typical spring bar type, but that's absolutely fine. And has two push to release bars and clips in nice and firmly, releases nice and easily. Now, just to give an idea of the size difference, uh, this on my wrist is my Breitling Super Avenger, which is 44 mil, 44, 46, I'm not entirely sure, it's huge. The thing's a tank. And this, of course, is 36, um, which is an enormous difference, as you can see, like so. But, despite only being 36 millimeter, I think that has got quite a bit of presence in its own right, um, considering that's uh, much, much smaller than the Breitling. That doesn't actually look that much smaller. Do uh, I don't think so. What, what do you think? You know, uh, comments, comment below. Uh, let me know what you think on that. So I'm just going to take this one off a moment. And obviously I will need to remove some links to size this, but and that's how it looks on the wrist, which is a really nice size, I think. And I also find the uh, Submariner cases, which are 40, I think, 41, 42 maybe. Uh, but I always think they fit well as well. I think it's just a thing about oyster cases. Oyster cases fit so well on the wrist. It's just, it's like a second skin. They're so comfortable. And... People can say what they like about them, but until you've actually worn an oyster case on your wrist, you just have no concept of how comfortable they are to wear compared to some other watches. This one's a shining example. I mean, the fact that it weighs a ton doesn't really help in the comfort zone uh, criteria. But you know you've got this one on. But also various other dive watches I've had in the past, you know you're wearing them. Whereas anything with an oyster type case, uh, or an actual oyster case, it just fits really, really nicely. You've got fairly long lugs, but they're not too long. So that's super comfortable. I'm just going to get the vernier calipers and we're going to double check. So we've got 36 millimeter minus the crown and about 39 with the crown, lug to lug is 45.5 millimeters. And then the lug spacing is, yikes, try not to scratch that, is 19 millimeters. And the bracelet, as you can see, tapers, that tapers down to, 16 millimeters. So there's the information for those of you wanting to know. The case back is uh, very nicely etched or engraved. And it says uh, 100 meter, Alley's dive, all stainless steel, automatic movement, PT500, PT5000 divers, or divers 100 meter, etc. 
it says on the dial, Addis Dive automatic, 100 meters, 330 feet is the depth rating. The depth rating on these watches, I will always personally take with a pinch of salt and I will always perform my own water resistance testing before I submerge one. Simply because a watch from a Swiss manufacturer with a depth rating has to comply with that. It has to have been tested to that depth rating. Generally speaking, the Chinese homage watches, the majority of them, and even your micro brands, which are in essence Chinese micro brand watches in many cases, have not actually been tested individually. The one exception to that that I know of is the uh, Helm Komodo I have, which came with a certificate of testing and that certificate of testing showed the conditions, the depth, the pressure, and the time that it was subjected to that testing, which I thought was a very nice little addition. So uh, these, essentially, it says what it says on the dial. It's up to you whether you're going to believe that. I'm not going to believe that without checking it myself. I know several people who have had homage watches and submerged them and have not had any problems whatsoever. With decent machining, decent tooling, and decently made cases, there's really no reason for there to be a problem uh, because the seals, the sealing faces are good, the seals are good, and they're not like Chinese watches of the 1980s and 90s that you could get uh, on car boots for next to nothing. However, it does say, and I'm going to show you this because in the user guide, we have um, a relatively thorough user guide. Automatic watch manual tells you how to use that. Quartz, date setting, and etc. etc. And then we have a water resistance guide. And these always make me chuckle a little because what we have here is three atmospheres. And it essentially says uh, light rain and, uh, and sort of light water droplets, five atmospheres, um, light rain up to heavy rain, 10 atmospheres, shower and swimming. Now, this is absolute nonsense. And this is a bit of a myth. And this is something I see perpetuated on groups all the time, where somebody says, oh, your watch is only 30 meters water resistant. That means it's only good enough for like maybe washing the pots and, uh, and getting raindrops on. It's nonsense. This is a, a perpetuated myth that's come from cheap watches that were not built up to that standard in the past. Swiss watches, when they had a water resistance rating, they had to be water resistant to that degree. So if you bought a Swiss watch that said 50 meters water resistant, it had to withstand the pressure of water up to a depth of 50 meters. That's exactly what it means. And it's one of my bugbears when I see this perpetuated time and time again by people just repeating uh, by rote something they read on a vlog or a, a blog, uh, heard on a vlog or read on a blog. And that, oh yes, if you've got a 30 meter water resistant watch, that means it's actually only suitable for, uh, for getting a few raindrops on while you're out for a walk and it's, it's, it's nonsense. If it says 30 meters on it, it should withstand 30 meters of pressure. Strangely enough, this water resistance chart shows the depth rating in atmospheres, three, five, 10, 20, 30, and 100. Um, and the dial shows the depth rating in meters and feet just to add a little bit of confusion. Why that is, I don't know, but one atmosphere is approximately 33 feet. So uh, three atmospheres would be approximately 100 feet. This particular watch is 330 feet or 100 meters. So that would be um, about 10 atmospheres. And Accordingly, this should be suitable for submerging. This this says anything up to swimming, but this, this should be sub suitable for submerging up to that depth. Whether it will or not, I don't know. And, you know, a watch like this is probably not going to guarantee it. So don't, you know, don't cast iron guarantee that that will be the case. That's the bracelet resized. A couple of recommendations regarding that. 
uh, you will need some kind of block to support your bracelet on and a small hammer to drive the pins out. Some of them were very stiff. I removed two links on each side and made a couple of um, holes adjustment for my wrist on this one. So it will go down to quite a small wrist. Um, mine is seven point, do you know, I can't remember off the top of my head, seven, seven, seven and a half ish, something like that. So the tool that's provided will punch the pins out no problem, but some of them were very stiff, so you will need a support block and a hammer or something to knock them out. Be very careful because the sides of the links are polished. Irritatingly, the pin for driving the bracelet pins out is too thick to use on the clasp. Not a problem for myself because I've got plenty of little tools and what have you but a bit infuriating if you just bought the watch and that's the only tool that you have. So bear that in mind in case you need to make micro adjustments on the clasp. Minor thing, when all said and done, it's quite nice that it actually comes with a tool to allow you to adjust the bracelet anyway. The bracelet itself uh, is really nicely finished, very comfortable now that it's sized for my wrist accordingly. And I'm just um, showcasing the case back there with its very nice engraving. I'm going to do the time grapher test and we'll take a look at the numbers in varying positions on a fresh wind out of the box. This is then going to be worn for a week and I'll do another reading at the end of the week to see if there's any difference as things have kind of bedded in and see what's what. Depending on the results, I may look at stripping the movement and just checking how well it's been assembled, lubricated, etc. I may do that out of curiosity. It depends how much time I've got and whether I've got the inclination to do it at that point, but we'll see. But I'm going to wear it for a week and then do a comparison of the results. So this is all going to be in one video. So obviously um, this is going to happen over the course of a week or so. I'm going to do a pressure test and see if it is actually watertight. And finally, I'm going to pop the macro lens on and we're going to get some really nice close-up detail so you can see this in very, very good detail, just in case this is something you're thinking of treating yourself to. There are several versions of this. There's a larger diameter, cheaper one with an NH35, which are okay, but you know, they're a so-so movement. And there's also a 36 millimeter with a quartz movement, which I believe is a Seiko quartz movement and has uh, and mimics the sweeping of the second hand. So let's pop this on the time grapher and take a look at the readings. So we've got the watch mounted in the stand on the bench. It's had a full wind, you'll note that it is mounted with the crown unscrewed and on this side there's a reason for that and at some point I want to make a detailed video about time graphers and the use of because I often see them being used in I wouldn't say incorrectly but not in an optimal sense and there's much more to a time grapher than sticking a watch on and saying, ah, yes, that's running five seconds fast. So by the by, we don't want to get into that just now, just a quick mention, but there it is um, currently dialed down and we've got the time grapher here. So I'm going to set lift angle to 50 degrees period to two seconds. That means it will resample every two seconds. Press the start button. I'm just going to zoom in on the time grapher so you can see. <coughs> Excuse the cough there. So dial down, we've currently got a gain of plus 10 with an amplitude of 293 degrees. We need to let this run to uh, for about a minute to get a good average. So we've currently got a consistent average plus 10 seconds 0.2 milliseconds B terror, which is absolutely fine, and just under 300 degrees. Remembering, of course, this is fresh out of the um, fresh out of the box with a first wind, so pretty good numbers so far. Very consistent, 
and tens across the board. It's like an episode of Strictly. So we flip that to dial up and give that a couple of seconds to stabilize. And we've got a beat error of 0.3 milliseconds, amplitude of 288 currently, 290, and around plus four, plus five. I think it's going to stabilize at about plus four dial up. Now the reason we test dial up and dial down is that the amplitude and rate should be quite similar in both positions with a well-adjusted watch. Now as you can see there's, there's a bit of a discrepancy in the rate between dial up and dial down but I'm not going to worry about that at the moment. That could just be down to differential uh, oiling on the cap jewels. So I'm not going to worry about that just, uh, just right now. But we've got a consistent plus four um, and a 290 amplitude dial up. The next position we need to look at is pendant down or nine high. I'm just going to restart that so that the trace is in the middle. Now we've got a slightly increased beat error of 0.4 milliseconds. Again, it's fine. Anything below one millisecond is not going to affect the timekeeping particularly and the reason of having a minimal beat error is actually to aid with the self-starting because it means the um, the impulse jewel needs to be as central as possible at its rest point so that any deviation with power from the train will start the balance will self-start the balance rather and um, and that's the real reason for the beat error being accurate so you don't don't worry about always chasing a zero obviously if I do uncase this watch and take a look at the movement I will make adjustments because I like things to be you know a little bit neater uh, but we've got a nice straight trace again we're looking at sort of a plus eight plus nine average there and an amplitude of about 270 which is not bad move that to pendant right or six high. Now the beat error dropped to point 0.1. It's common to get a little deviation in your beat error between hanging positions incidentally. If you've got a perfect zero beat error dial up dial down it's not uncommon to have a beat error of point 0.1, point 0.2 or even point 0.3 in the hanging positions and in pendant right or six high it looks like we're going to be averaging plus six, plus seven. Thereabouts. And amplitude of about 270, so that's good. And then the next position that we're going to test is pendant up or three high. When I refer to pendant up, pendant right, pendant left, etc., I'm speaking in terms of the pendant on a wristwatch being at three o'clock. And sometimes that's not the case. Sometimes the pendant might be at 12 o'clock on a bullhead, for example, but I still think in terms of pendant at three o'clock. Um, but just in case, it is always helpful to stipulate three high, nine high, six high, etc., just to differentiate. So there we've got a slightly high again and similar kind of amplitude, 265 ish, and we're running at about plus 16 or so. And the position that you typically don't test, but I like to do for the sake of completion, no matter the movement I'm working on is pendant uh, right or 12 high. Oh, sorry, pendant left even, or 12 high, I'm confusing myself there. And there we've got a beat error, 0 0.4, 0 0.5. Again, around 266, so around the two, you know, 270-ish, which is fine for a hanging position. And we're looking at about a plus 17, with a little bit of variation there. 
So on the whole, not bad for a, a movement fresh out of the box, first wind and just starting to run because we have to work on the assumption that this movement has been factory assembled, run through a series of tests, rough regulated and then placed into packaging and sent off to whichever factory has assembled it into this watch. And that is not bad at all. We've got a little bit of positional uh, variation which you would expect with a cheaper movement, but not not huge, not uh, not vast and not particularly worrying, all in the plus figures. So we're talking about um, 10 seconds deviation approximately just from a rough calculation there. We'll just flick that back to pendant down and we should see that amplitude increase and the rate stabilized back down to the sort of plus nines that it was before. There we go. So. That's the reading fresh out of the box. I'm going to wear this for a week and we'll take another reading after a week and see how that looks. And as I say, depending on the circumstances, I may actually disassemble the movement and clean it, inspect it, see how well it's lubricated from the factory, clean it and service it. But we'll see how that goes. Just here, I'm gonna do a quick loom test. I've got my uh, UV light. So I'm just giving the watch a bit of a charge up. You see it's got quite a nice, nice, nice blue glow, the BGW9 type glow. And uh, next to it is the Super Avenger, which I'm wearing, which is a few years old and Breitling tend to have very good loom, bear in mind. So this is kind of, it's not a which is better. This is just for comparative reasons. And that's not bad, that's not bad at all. Uh, obviously, I don't know how long that's going to last as yet. That will need to be tried and tested. But one of the nice things is the dials, the dial and the hands have got good matching loom. And quite often with a lot of the Chinese homage watches, you get a mismatch in the loom on the dial and the loom on the hands. So I'm quite pleased with that. Just before the waterproofing test, we'll have another wrist shot. Now that's resized. Uh, very nice engraved milled clasp, better than a lot of the uh, fold over steel dive clasps like my steel dive Willard which is a pressed clasp with a fold over and it's not very nice, Not very. it's not the best made. It does the job, just not very pretty. This is nice and sturdy and nicely finished. Really nice oyster style bracelet which is very comfortable, solid stainless with pin connected links. And of course the oyster style case, which is super comfortable on the wrist as they always are. And uh, complete with the big phosphorus numerals as Ian Fleming would say, and indeed did in one of the novels. The case is also nice and slim, which I like. And considering the 28242 is not the slimmest automatic movement around, I think that's pretty good going. The next step is I'm going to pop it on the vacuum tester to check the water resistance and then we will get some nice close-up shots of the watch for you. So what you see in front of us here is the Elmer vacuum tester. This is a dry tester and it works by creating a vacuum and uh, seeing if, I need to lift that a little, and seeing if air escapes from the case. So what we do is place the watch on the stand and the pad and we raise this up until the needle deflects enough so that we can see. You see this, you see we have a dial gauge up here and, then, and a needle which deflects. Sometimes it jiggles about and you have to kind of reposition it but uh, hopefully it will behave nicely for us. So we pop that on there, we zero the gauge we pop the lid on and switch on the vacuum. What we want to see is a positive pressure change and we are seeing that. You can hopefully see the needle is deflecting. And that's going up to about plus five, which is, you know, about right for a good modern um, watertight case with a crystal, with a glass crystal. 
some of the older ones with plexiglass crystals will flex a little bit more because what's happening is the air pressure from around the watch, you'll see that that's not moving anywhere. The air pressure from around the watch will have been sucked out of the chamber. So the atmospheric pressure inside the watch case will actually allow the case to expand in the vacuum very slightly. And that's the deflection that you're seeing on this gauge. If there's an air leak, it will either stay at zero or it will deflect into the negative territory because the case is actually having the air sucked out of it and shrinking. With a case with an acrylic crystal, the expansion will be greater because there's much more flex in the acrylic crystal and sometimes you'll get the same with thin uh, steel case backs on older watches as well. But so far, so good. That's actually holding a vacuum there's the needles not dropping, it's staying quite constant at a plus five. When I do a pressure test on watches after a service, I will do this and then go and make myself a coffee or something and leave it for 10 or 15 minutes and come back to see if there's been any difference. Sometimes you will get a very, very slight leak and the needle will deflect back to zero and that means that there is a very slight leak somewhere in the case, the crystal, the case back, etc. So, so far that's looking very good. Plus five and it's staying there. So let the air out and you can see the needle drops back down, not quite to the zero. So I'll just, oh, there it is about, but I'll just do it again, just to, just to make absolutely certain. Because sometimes the watch can jiggle about on the base and affect the reading on the dial. But that's looking pretty good. I would be confident enough to submerge that. Obviously, if you were to take the back off for any reason, you would need to regrease, refit the gasket and check it again. And of course, if necessary, replace the gasket if any of them are damaged. But all in all, I'm quite pleased with that. So I'll release the air from the chamber, lift the gauge and slide out the watch. And there we are, one pressure tested watch. Now let's get on to the close-ups. So taking a look at this up close and personal, you can see the stainless milled clasp and you can see that's nice and thick and very nicely made good quality the solid link stainless oyster bracelet polished side links and polished inside. All nice smooth edges, so there's no, no sharp edges anywhere on this. It's very nicely done. And then onto the watch. So the dial's very simple, but very tastefully done. Addis Dive logo, uh, minimal text, automatic, 100 meters, 330 feet. We have got a signed, oops, a signed Addis Dive crown and highly polished sides with the oyster style case, polished bezel and brushed steel lugs. Again, nice sharp finishing, but no unpleasant sharp edges. The quality of these watches just cannot be disputed because they really, really are getting better and better. Um, and they, they're just so nicely finished compared to the kind of quality of watches that were coming out of China just maybe 20 years ago or so. Certainly compared to some relatively recent sort of 90s and noughties uh, Swiss watches, the quality of finishing is definitely on a par with those. Maybe not quite up to par with modern Swiss watches, excuse the mucky fingerprints. And there you can see the highly polished side links of the bracelet. Nice printing on the dial, very crisp, excuse the dust 
there and a highly polished bezel as well. So all in all, for the cost of this watch, which was about 160 great British pounds from the Addis Dive website, and I think it was about 140, 145 with the discount code that I happened to have, it's frankly a bargain. You, you would have a bit of a job on getting an ETA 28242 movement for that money let alone an entire watch. So it's, you know, it's really a bargain.